as he shares your word so we could take it from here and use it for your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome. Amen. Well, you know, just to get your mind right, you know, a lot of times I think uh, on our journey, we, we forget that we're washed white as snow by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And that's our qualifier, and that's what we stand on, and uh, that's why we live the way we live, and all of that. Tonight, I really, I've been motivated uh, with a thought that, that was really in alignment with what I was trying to put together for tonight, and it came right out of the mouth of, of, the mouth of one of the people that have had a large influence on me just by the sincerity and, and legitimacy of, of their walk with the Lord. And it was a, a friend of mine that at one time was somebody that I was watching, uh, just came to know the Lord, and I was watching from a distance that was a musician. And, and uh, this individual, over the years, has had a huge impact, as I realized and have had the opportunity to spend time with uh, at a per, on a personal level and got to know uh, somebody and see behind the scenes of their life, you know, and that's Glenn Kaiser, and you hear me talk about him periodically. But, but he's a genuine uh, disciple of Jesus, and and true through and through, and and because of it, um, it he's largely uh, influenced my life because I see he lives what comes out of his mouth, and uh, and that's a huge thing. But I, I want to just say that. He was doing one of his little blogs, and, and he said something that, that was profound because it was a, correlating with the thought process that I was on as I was getting ready for this evening. And he was talking about uh, the alabaster jar, uh, beautiful perfume. Uh, and he, he just was talking in reference to that, and he was reflective, and he always does has these little blogs, and he's just... He was actually sitting in his car, and he was having this little conversation with whosoever would be watching. And he started to reflect on that a little bit. It took me into deep meditation and, and thought in regards to exactly that topic. And I realized something that had a, a huge impact in my life was when I first got saved, when I first asked the Lord to save me, the reason that back in the day they called that radically saved is because there was no question in my mind that I was redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, so the transformation wasn't something that was hazy or confusing or any of these different things. It was absolutely 100% in your face, life changing for real. And because of it, I was very quick to get myself uh, acclimated of what it meant to be a disciple of Christ. And it was really contingent on, you know, understanding what does that mean uh, per God's perspective versus mine. But I'll tell you, I, I feel so grateful over all the years as I've watched so many people struggle on their journeys with Christ and I'm not suggesting for one moment that I don't struggle on my journey with Christ. But I do know this, that I have a deep conviction because when the light came on for me, I saw it. Amen? I saw it. Because of it, there's a driving force. And so that's what's compelled me tonight to bring you a word that I think that could be, you know, potentially life-changing if we allow it to be. If you have your Bibles, if you turn with me to Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, we're going to look at verse 36 and following, Luke chapter 7, verse 36 and following, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. 
So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. I just I want to stop there for a second. I just when I when I hear that, I have something to tell you. And then and the response, of course, is this, you know, tell me, teacher. You know, I think of the the words in scripture that ring in my head so many times when when somebody sits and it asks for some godly counsel in their life. They ask, you know, I, I want to know something. I want to know something. Enlighten me from my perspective to something else. And they say, tell me, teacher. And it's words of Scripture that say, always hearing and never perceiving. Right? Always hearing or never comprehending. And so many times, people are hearing with an ear just to give an answer, to respond, or, or they think they already know something. And so the information that's coming into their head, it hits the floor. It doesn't have any impact. And I, and I would suggest that that's exactly the content of this. As we go on, it says, Jesus says this, as two people owned, owed money to a certain money lender. One of them owned, owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay, it, to pay him back. So he forgave the debt of both. Which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the, the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not has stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As her great love has shown, but whoever has been Forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I just want to let you to hear something really clear. So you have a woman coming into a house. Let, let me just come down on the floor for a minute. You know, a woman that comes to this house of a Pharisee. There's your first problem. Because of her lifestyle and the house she was going to, that's probably not the most welcoming place to show up at. But she comes to the house of this Pharisee and she's got this, you know, treasure with her. And her whole objective is to get close to Jesus. And with a broken heart comes to him. And her tears are hitting his feet. Her hair is becoming the towel. And the perfume is poured out. And you, you can imagine the mentality of the Pharisee, the religious person, you know, kind of like maybe what some churches might be, of somebody saying, Oh, do you know who you're talking to? He obviously, this this man were a prophet, he'd know that this woman is is this kind of lady, right? Or woman or whoever. He might even have said, you know, this woman, they might have said, he would have known that he's dealing with a tramp. Probably could be the tone of the conversation. But Jesus 
sees what's happening in our heart. He sees something happening that's amazing. But also, when you, when you get your mind wrapped around this, the one that's forgiven much, loves much. And, and I'm just going to tell you something tonight. I don't know where you're at spiritually. I don't know what your perspective is on, you know, God's forgiveness provided by the precious blood of Christ. But here's the deal for everybody sitting in this room. You hear me say this all the time. It's like, preacher, you always hammer us with the same scriptures. Listen to me. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Every one of us have been forgiven large if you've received that gift of salvation through the blood, shed blood of Jesus. So for us, we have an attitude, a perspective problem. You hear what I'm telling you? Because we might think we've been forgiven little because, you know what, maybe I'm like one of the Pharisees. Maybe I'm like one of the people that think that I've got it all together. And, it, and it, you know, the, maybe, the, maybe the Pharisee might have thought, you know, Jesus coming to my house, this is an honor for him to be able to be in my presence. You hear what I'm telling you? Maybe in our attitude of our heart, we think that maybe we're somebody that, that the church is fortunate to have our presence. And we might look lowly on the person who comes through the door that God is going to do an amazing work. And let, let me just clarify something. The Bible says, no one comes to the Father except he draws them. Right? No one comes to the Father except he draws them. So if they come through the door, they come to the door and they're broken. They're sitting there and the Word starts to have an impact on them. And, and they're broken. It's because God Almighty, who sent his only begotten Son, has drawn them to a place to receive that. And so who are we to have an attitude that would somehow hold that in contempt? Instead, instead, maybe we would say, Oh God, would you give me a heart that I could be so vulnerable that I would enter a space with people that I know would condemn me and hate me and say all sorts of nasty things and I don't give a hoot. I just want to get in your presence. I want to express what it is that I know that I'm receiving. You know, I was doing a lot of study, and I'm looking at all these people who sought out Jesus. We had Zacchaeus that climbs a tree, right? This wants to see Jesus. And, of course, Jesus spots that out and says, Come on down, I'm eating at your house today. Amen? You know, you, you see other people in Scripture, most of the time they had an ailing family member or something, and they know that he had the power to heal. So they would call upon him. And they'd want to get close to him. And the truth of it is, rarely did you see somebody who just wanted to worship Jesus. Just wanted to worship Him. You know that you can understand in our lives, we do religious things and we're, we're a product of our culture. But we need to be disciples of Jesus Christ, amen? We need to allow Him to so deeply change us that we take our alabaster jar and spill it at his feet. Amen? And so, so get your mind wrapped around the context. A religious person, a, a wayward woman, and Jesus, the Messiah. And, and this unfolds. So bear with me. So you get this picture. And for the sake of understanding the context and what we're talking about and a little bit of, of background to understand that this is a big, big deal, that he forgives her sins, and they're freaking over that, right? They're freaking. They're religious people. For the sake of understanding what we're talking about here tonight, there's a lot of Simons in Scripture, amen? There's a lot of Simons in Scripture. Simon was a very common uh, name in the New Testament times. And there's, um, there's Simons. There was Simon Peter, the one that was uh, Jesus' closest companion. And uh, Simon of Zealot was another one of Jesus' disciples. And Simon of Cyrene uh, carried Jesus' cross. And a lot of scholars believe that the Simon that I'm going to talk about next, Simon the leper, they believe Jesus may have very well healed him 
And as a result, uh, this is the reason for this meeting here at this home that you're going to hear now, which is found in Mark chapter 14, verse 1 and following. So now, now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But during the festival, they said, they said, the, uh, they wouldn't do it because the people might riot. Why was while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table of the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor will always be with you. And you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured the perfume on my body beforehand to prepare it for burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be also told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched he watched for the opportunity to hand him over. So you have a different group of people here. You have potentially somebody that's been healed of leprosy. You have a woman that comes in. You have a voice from the inside this time that's concerned about the perfume's value. And then it has this religious twist to it as well. You understand, we could have sold that and given it to the poor. On the outside, sounds pretty good. We just want to be good stewards. You know how that goes, right? Once again, Jesus looking at the heart. And you see this individual that anoints his head. And the true picture that unfolds is the ugliness of, of the very last part of that scripture, Judas went to the chief priests to betray Jesus. You know what? I, interestingly, that's the voice that's coming from the crowd saying, what is going on with this being spilled out? Are you kidding me? He's the one holding the purse. He's no more concerned for the poor than anything. The truth of it is, that very well could have been the lure that the devil used to push him over the edge to go to betray Christ himself. All of a sudden, you know what? You, you spill that out, I don't get my hand in that cookie jar, I'm going to go get some dough from these guys. I'm going to switch teams. Let me just tell you, the inspiration that came over me when I really started to contemplate. You know, what is God asking out of us tonight? I don't know where you're at spiritually, what walk of life you're in, but I know this. I know that we are challenged deeply with what is our alabaster jar. What has great value that the Lord wants from us. He's not interested in your money, let me just tell you that. This isn't one of, like, one of those TV preachers that are going to tell you to get your wallet out now. And... No, listen to what I'm trying to tell you. The first woman you see is a woman who is so broken that she takes her, her best, what, anything that she has, and brings it, and breaks it out and just lets it spill and splash in an expression of love to do what she did. And what I'm suggesting is I think that on our journey we forget something. 
we start getting religious and we start saying, I want to be careful where I direct these things and they're governed centrally by our own heart. You hear me? They're governed by our heart. Instead of everything we have is God's. And we're stewards of that. Now, when I say that, once again, this isn't a money pitch. This is talking about the contents of our heart, a surrendered heart to Christ himself, a life that says he wants to accomplish something in and through our lives. <clears throat> and until we get past, until we get past, you know, being concerned about somebody when I'm entering the house, you know, in the first case, the, the Pharisees, the, they think, you know, whoever, maybe I, I feel like somebody's looking down on me or something, so therefore I'm not going to do anything more because I, I, I'm not, I don't like that. And God's saying, get over that. Get past that. And then, you know, I've got all these hang-ups, so, you know, there's always the rainy day fund, and, you know, and I, want to, I better not let go of this group of people that I'm hanging with because you never know if this Jesus thing doesn't work out. I, I, I need to go back over here. And, and so something we possess very well could be the alabaster jar that's a, a level of worship we can enter into with Christ. There's an expression that he feels and we feel that's not an emotion that's welled up that, you know, just the, something gets stirred up in us and we're, you know, we're, having, oh, we're, having, a, we're having a religious a Holy Ghost experience and it's nothing more than, than my adrenaline flowing and I've got a bunch of things in my life that need to get the heck out in order that he, then God can put a bunch of things in. And so when I think about what is your alabaster box, there says a lot of things. There's things that God's calling for in our life. He says, listen, I want you to pour this out in front of me. I want you to pour this out in front of me, but I want you to get to the place that you can comprehend what it is to in your mind, and in your heart, and in your being, desire to spill it out before Him. It, it goes from a religious experience, or, or, the, or the mechanical, you know, step by step, day by day, I'm a church-going person, and Jesus is my Savior, but I'm Lord of my own life into something that becomes, you know, I understand graphically clear that the price that was paid for me said that I can say, I, looking into the recesses of my heart, can say, Abba, Father, because he qualified me. And so when I, when I get that, you know, a hold of that, you know, and any of you sitting in here, a lot of people struggle with their, their walk with Jesus because they know the ugliness of their own heart. Right? And the Bible says your heart's deceitfully wicked beyond cure. We know that. We know there's ugly thoughts. There's, there's things that we have to g submit to the Lordship of Christ. And, and the truth of it is, is that's the very thing that makes me fall on his feet and pour it all out. Because I know by no merit can I make it there at all. I can't. It's only by the shed blood of Christ that I come before him and I just melt. I fall to the ground in, in absolute sober reality that my redemption was bought by the blood of Jesus. And that that redemption changes lives and if it's not changing your life, you've got an alabaster jar that needs to be spilled out. It needs to be spilled out. And let me tell you, it starts with coming to the point to understand there is a day that you stand before Almighty God and give an account for your life. And if you do that outside of Christ, He is not your Savior. He is your judge. So to understand the re redemptive process that God loved us so much that He sent Jesus to pay that penalty for you. So when I get my mind wrapped around that, and I start to realize, boy, these things crowd into my life. They crowd into my life. And, and I'm always thinking about, you know, the scripture that talks about us being a fragrant offering to God. Right? Can you imagine being a fragrant offering to the Lord? Amen? 
You know, I learned something. When I was in Brazil, I learned something about words that translate over, that sometimes you, you better know what you're talking about. Yeah. You don't say to them, that's tasty, because tasty for them means it's foul or sour or bad, right? In the U.S., you would say, hey, that's tasty, and they'd be like, no, that's bad. So, so when I think about a fragrant offering, I'm not talking about a fart in an elevator. I'm, to, I'm not talking about a stench of, you know, we're, we're redeemed by the blood of Christ, but we smell like a, like a baby diaper container. In reality, outside of Christ himself, outside of Jesus, we end up at a place that that's who we are. The truth of it is you get to the recesses of your heart and you understand the depth of what that is. You understand that, boy, for me to be this fragrant offering, I, I've got some things i got to lay at the foot of the cross. Amen? i got some things I'm going to have to surrender to him. I'm going to have to say, you know what, Lord, your word says this, and, I, and I'm doing this. There's, there's a conflict here. How do I reconcile that conflict? How, how do I reconcile? Well, I, I lay it at the foot of the cross. I say, Lord, you know what this is going to be? This is going to be an offering. I remember the Saturday night service that we had a precious saint of the Lord in her 90s sitting right up here. And during the invitation, she came up and threw her pack of cigarettes right on the steps to give them to the Lord. 90s, folks, 90s. Came up and gave that to the Lord. Said this, here you go. I don't want these anymore. And so, you know, you think about for her, she wasn't trying to prolong the length of her life. You hear what I'm telling you? There wasn't a benefit in it for her other than she felt like, you know what, Something in the message she got a hold of and said, for her, that meant those need to go, right? And so what is your alabaster jar? What do you think God might want to say to you that you could, you could offer to him? What attitude maybe you could bring and say, Lord, I, I'm not there. I'm not, like, I'm not like that woman that went in there Subject to all that ridicule and whatever. You know, you remember the woman at the well? Out in the heat of the day? She comes out in the heat of the day, and lo and behold, who's there at the well? Jesus. Jesus meets her there. The scripture doesn't say, you know, it's just that he confronts the fact that the man that she's with is not her husband, and he, he tells her how many times she's been married, and, and they have this exchange. But it's probably because the woman was out in the heat of the day because she didn't want the ridicule of just the citizens. And Jesus met her, and she ends up going back to the same community and bringing all these people with to meet this Messiah. Come see a man that told me everything about me. There was a radical transformation that took an outcast and brought her in to be the spokesperson for the community. So when you think about what is it to end up in them shoes, maybe you've never come to a place to really have contemplated. You know, why don't I have that attitude? Why are there so many things that are in the way of my relationship with Jesus? To be so intimate, it's the only thing that matters. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because I ask a lot of questions, and when we, we have devotional time and so on and so forth, I like to ask a lot of questions, and I always get answers from people, and the ones that come on a daily basis now pretty much know the drill. But I'll hear answers a lot of times, and in Sunday school, I'll hear answers of people to the, the churchy answers, Right? I'm not talking about that. Listen, I'm talking about a legitimate place that somebody has driven. Can you imagine, remember the woman who was bleeding for years and years and makes her way through the crowd just to touch Jesus' garment because she knew if I could touch him, I'll be healed. 
So she took the ridicule of being unclean and being amongst these people and fights her way into the crowd to touch him. Are you there? Do you want to just touch him? Do you feel deep inside that that would be the desire of your heart if you could put anything of any value and say, I just want to touch him? More importantly, I want him to touch me. That I want that to be legitimate in my heart. I, I don't want to be confused. I don't want to be you know, at a place that I'm too concerned about everybody around me and what they're thinking or what they're doing or whatever. I want to run in there. I want to run in there and it be in his presence in order that I can be healed. All of those things that I put at a place of, of value in my life that are, you know, taking me in the wrong direction. God, I, I want to give them to you. I want to legitimately do it, but I can't do it with a heart that's not in alignment with that. Because that's just going to be a temporal thing that's going to immediately... There was a young guy that we were dealing with years ago. We were talking about... He was listening to this death metal music, and some of the, the lyrics were horrific. Of the, 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 what they were saying, it was, it was devil worship, uh, uh, thrash metal, or whatever it was called. And so he was asking, you know, what do you think about this? I said, there's a dumpster out in the back. I, and I think it's probably calling for that stuff. Just go around, drive around back, act like you got some sense, and just spill that stuff in the dumpster. Dump it in the dumpster, and just give it to the Lord as an offering, just like this. So as you watch it, you hear him hit the bump. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Same guy goes out and buys the same material again. Did that hit you like a wave? Listen to me. Because God speaks to us, and he gives us a word. It needs to be amen, and that settles it. Amen, and that settles it. Because we are competing continually with a desire of our own human heart, right? Right? We're led astray by the, our own evil desires, and then we're enticed. And then once we get past that, we have something else that's going on. We have this problem that continually, you know, plagues us of just being baited, continually baited by the devil. He knows our patterns. He knows these things, and he, and he baits us. And we just walk in aimlessly, and we never get to the point to say, I just want Jesus. I just want Jesus. That's what it is. I just want Christ. And so for us, if you consider the time of year that we're at, as we, you know, spring is here. We're gonna, the clock is going to be sprung ahead tonight. So if you, you're here tonight, make sure you take care of that. But guess what that brings? Right around the corner, we're at Easter. And we're talking about Jesus' crucifixion. And of course, Easter morning, the resurrection from the dead. And so maybe if we considered, if we took this time and we considered, you know, what does it look like in our life? What, what do we have that God might really want from us? And so I'm going to tell you, if you're somewhere out there and you have no idea what it is to want to pour out whatever before to the feet of Jesus, no desire to do that at all. Let me tell you what, you, what your alabaster box is that you can give them right now. You can give them a sincere heartfelt prayer that says, God, I want that desperately. I want to comprehend what it is to worship you. To be so motivated in my life that it's that real to be motivated. That would be an offering that we could give them. And maybe you're here and you're, you're examining your heart and you say, you know what, there was a time that I really was that. There was a time that I didn't care who was around or what was happening and that I would, you know, continually be at the feet of Jesus. I'd be, I didn't care who was watching. But now things have changed, you understand? All these different things are going on. I've got all these responsibilities. And I really don't remember what that was like at all. Well, that's a good place to, to come to the Lord and say, I want that fire back. And maybe, just maybe, as I'm here tonight and I'm speaking to you, maybe, just maybe, the Lord's given you some words about some things in your life that don't belong there. That you can assemble for him and you can pour that out at his feet and say they're yours, Lord. I'm not going to clog up 
this journey with any of that nonsense. Maybe you're here and you're saying, you know what, I think I would, I think I want to pour these things out. I think I would, and if the Lord ever asks it from me, I'll give it to him. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about without reservation. You know, like the Apostle Paul said, my life is being poured out like a drink offering. My life is being poured out like a drink offering. You know, and I always had that image of, of knocking something over on the table, you know, and if you watch your coffee, uh, water, whatever it is, you see it hit the table and it just takes the least path of resistance, boom, it's gone. Your life being poured out. You can imagine saying, Lord, I want to give that to you as so whatever you want to use, it's yours. So each one of us comes to a place tonight to say, where am I on this journey? Where, where is this place in my life with this alabaster jar? Where is the true, legitimate worship in my heart? Does it exist? Does it exist? Because that's a word we use a lot, worship, right? And I'm telling you, there's people that, that struggle for years and years, and they go through these experiences, and, they'll, and they don't have worship uh, in their heart, and so therefore... They go from one church to another. I didn't like the music. I didn't like the preacher. I don't like this. I don't like that. And, and at the end of the day, it really boils down to they don't have the heart of worship. They're not there. They don't have the heart of worship. And so to, to comprehend that, you know, to experience it, I've, I've had the blessing of seeing God's saints come together in worship, watching someone love Jesus you know, with their arthritis so bad in their fingers, they were taped together with number two pencils taped on them, playing the piano that way. And putting out songs that we just gave to the Lord. We sounded, sounded like somebody was, you know, I don't know, it was an assault on the eardrums, I'll tell you that. But I'm going to tell you the heart was where it needed to be. So where are you tonight? Where do you find yourself? You know, were, was there a time you were walking with them and it was tight? And you know it, and then something happened, and maybe you're not there anymore. Maybe you're, you're more concerned about what people think. Is there something going on in your life that the Lord just wants you to give it to him right now? Just, just wants you to give it to him. And so for you to get your mind wrapped around, you know, tonight as we head toward Easter, and we're going to experience, you know, all that that represents my thought here is that maybe we could be ready for that. You know, maybe on the front end of, of this season, we can say, Lord, I want to give you what's on my heart. I want to be a free agent bought by the blood of Jesus. I'm here, Lord. What do you want? And I want to experience that true worship, God, that is legitimate before you. Well, I always give an invitation every time that I assemble. Every time I come together with a group of people, I always give an invitation to say, you know, did you hear yourself in here? Were you then the front end of it? Are you the religious person that looks down on the one that's wayward? That you think you've arrived somewhere? And that so therefore you, you're so distant, you're just like maybe praying like the prayer of the Pharisee, oh Lord, thank you that I'm not that person. Or... Are you the wayward one that came through the door and you don't know that the Lord loves you deeply? And he wants you to receive from him that love. He wants to take you to the place legitimately for the first time to want to pour that out before him. You find yourself maybe like the leper that's been healed and you remember, you remember what it was to be, you know, stricken and then forgiven. And at first you were on fire for Jesus and then... Something happened, and you kind of just drifted off. Life happened. Or maybe you're like Judas. Maybe you're like Judas, and you're looking with a critical heart, and you see somebody that has genuine worship going on in their life, and, and it makes you angry. For some reason, it makes you angry. Maybe they're just, you're like, oh, they, they do everything they do just to be seen. That's why. 
you know, it's all a show. And maybe you're the one that wants to just turn around and betray him. I suggest tonight the right answer would be this. The right answer would be that we'd say, Lord, I want to lay this before you. I want that legitimate experience to pour out the, whatever it is you want from me. I want to pour it out for you, Lord. And I want to walk away from here knowing not only am I redeemed, but my worship is going to one that made that possible. Amen? Counselors, if you would come up, I always give an invitation, and which just simply means you have an opportunity to respond. You could talk to the Lord, and you could say, you know what, wherever I found myself on this journey, I want to do something about it tonight. I want to give you whatever it is, Lord. We'll pray about it right here, and we'll draw a line in the sand, and we're going to move forward from that spot. Amen? Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to address our hearts tonight right as an open book before you. And as we lay before you, God, whatever you're challenging us for, we want to pour it out, but we want to do it legitimately. We don't want to honor you with our lips and have our hearts far from you. So God, would you do what only you can do? Help us to put action to conviction. God, it's our desire that you'd receive the glory. Would you come as the music plays?
pray with me? Father God, thank you for this time we spent together. God, would you help us to be honest before you? Would you help us to deal with whatever you've exposed to us? That we would honor you. That we would respond to you. And from it, God, we want to accomplish your very purpose with a heart of worship. Let it be so. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed.